you can say who it is, I guess, in the show notes or whatever if you want. Right, okay. We'll work it out. I was going to start talking about how Peter Capaldi, for the second time in his career, changed into an English woman. We are going to use your Twitter handle. I, don't, I, be, I want to make sure this is okay before we do anything. Yeah. There's no way back. It's it's a shy one. It's <laughs> right because it, I, I couldn't get any of them because loads of other people because it's not an original idea at all to do a Malcolm Tucker Twitter account. Um, there's fucking hundreds of them out there. Then they've all been abandoned like fucking dead shells. <laughs> so uh, there. So it's Tucker Five Law because I never thought that I would be doing this for very long. Okay. I only imagined that I would be doing it for a couple of months. I had this random idea, and so I, I didn't give it any great deal of, of thought i just took whatever was was available so it was tucker's law you know but it was a five instead of an s to just be able to get it because tucker's law has already been had by some other cunt so that was it so it's it's tucker five law but it's tucker's law scottish independence or malcolm tucker parody what came first scottish independence i've always been a supporter of scottish independence for years and years and years before there was a referendum before there was any of that what inspired me on the the malcolm tucker thing was was purely i was I'm a keen watcher of politics and I was watching what just seemed to be the most colossally fucking dreadful campaign from the no side. And I found myself thinking, uh, you know, just cock up after cock up after cock up. And I just thought, can you imagine somewhere there is an experienced and qualified spin doctor you know, like the, the, the somewhere there's a Malcolm Tucker looking at this catastrophe of a fucking campaign and think and <laughs> screaming and pulling his hair out, you know. And so I just thought, fuck it. I, and I and I had a handful of, uh, it, you know, it just formed in my head mm-hmm. that I could I could hear Malcolm Tucker saying things and doing things. And and I and I'd just given up Facebook, and therefore the stuff that I used to put on Facebook was was brewing and bubbling in my head. And yeah, and so eventually it kind of emerged. As Malcolm mm-hmm. Tucker, Twitter is kind of like having to write a sonnet, right? In that, well, or a hell, haiku, a right? Because you've got this restriction, and if you if you're a parody account, I, I preferred it when there were less characters. Yeah, yeah. right. One, um, four, one four zero for life. When <laughs> even that was too many. Yeah, <laughs> for some yes. <laughs> All you need is three for yes. <laughs> but yeah. um, you've got to be you've got to be succinct on Twitter, unlike Facebook, but um, with, with a parody account, you've always got to sort of, or for the most part, you've got to kind of push it through a certain prism. Um, and therefore, you can't always just do what you want or say what you want. So it's a personal restriction. And that probably helps to a certain extent. I always feel a little bit guilty about the fact that I've basically just stolen somebody else's character but it is a character that i have a lot of sympathy for i I mean like malcolm took as sort of the bad guy in the thick of it but actually he's an anti-hero more isn't he well he he is but people like him for the wrong reason he's actually a man trying to keep control for a greater good although he's a cunt and he is a cunt he is a horrible cunt but he is trying to keep control for, for the greater good as he sees it and in that that I, I like that, if you know what I mean. So, okay, so it's a modern equivalent of like Sir Humphrey and Yes Minister. That's exactly how it started. Um, and Malcolm Tucker wasn't even meant to be the main character. Um, it was that Iman Iannucci had been asked to um, kind of update the idea of, of Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister um, for the sort of spin doctor era. Um, and as soon as they... Uh, as soon as they put kind of Peter Capaldi as Malcolm Tucker in front, it was perfectly obvious that that he was the 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 center point of it um but uh, yeah sorry to to go back to the point um yeah it does make me have to think about what i'm going to say because i can't be self-indulgent necessarily i can't just be me i've got to think about what i'm doing as a character i think that's it's if you if you're playing a character it does it limits you you've got like very you get certain avenues you can't go down which can be quite frustrating as well because you go like oh i really want to say this but you know that character that you're doing would not actually say that yeah i think everyone is a character like not just online but in any situation that you want to project a particular image to the people that you're amongst Hmm. i actually think my character on like my free caledonia account 
is the most authentic version of me that there is because it is anonymous well sort of I mean quite a lot of people know who I am but um, <laughs> But that allows a you know a great freedom where you can say what you want and you don't need to think about oh am I going to lose my job or yeah. is uh, you know my mum going to be pissed off that I said this thing about prostitution or whatever you know you don't need to worry about all that stuff which you know you do if you're using your real name on Facebook or whatever and your your uncle that you've not heard from is going to have a rant at you that that <laughs> that's liberating you know that and people have a go at anonymity because people do use it for the wrong reasons to just be horrible and nasty but. The freedom of it to say what you want is really important, I think. For now, until they come and clamp down until on... I'm arrested. <laughs> you get arrested. You know, I do have parody accounts at the same time, which are very specific and <laughs> very tightly... You know, there's a format that you've got to follow. <laughs> so that does... I really enjoy those restrictions of that. that you yeah. have to kind of work around it to try I and... I very you, much you enjoy those good accounts. Joke, like, How can I make that into this format? But again, as you say, it's it does limit you. So you're maybe less likely to come out with utter trash because you actually have to stop and think. Yeah. Where Twitter is, it's so... And I guess Facebook and all forms of social media, they're so seductive in the sense of the minute you kind of go like, I'm annoyed about this, you just thunder out the first sentence that comes to your head and you fire it off and then I'm sure there must be so many politicians put something out and I'm sure in the spur of a moment they've thought yes that's it but five minutes later they're like oh wait oh shit oh the, no a great account to follow if you don't is um, there's some some bot account that just retweets um, tweets that politicians have deleted <laughs> uh, but they're mostly they're mostly fucking half constructed things where they've got a spelling mistake or you know they've accidentally pressed send before they meant to that sort of thing but you get the occasional belter but um i mean i I think i think the other thing is that when i started the malcolm account it was purely it was it was purely in character all the time that malcolm was working at you know i created the scenario where malcolm had actually been drafted in to the independence campaign because it was such a shit show this this was how it started and, and and that he and so all of it I was trying to keep an eye on what was going on in real time and it and it was an incredibly fluid situation there was stuff you know it, you know hour to hour there were there were things kicking off all the time towards the end of it and I, I just so I was trying to respond in real time as if Malcolm was you know backstage at a campaign event tearing his hair out yeah. but as time went by and, and I had my own sort of personal. Uh, account uh, I, which I still regularly used for just sort of general stuff um, as time went by it just became more and more Malcolm and then after the independence referendum I put it away for ages and then I, I came back to it and since then it has morphed more into me it it, it is me and I, and I I mean the character of Malcolm Tucker is is you know, says horribly aggressive, sexually violent things. I don't do that and I won't do that, even though I do find that very, very funny in the context of watching the thick of it. But I won't do that online because it's far too easy for it to be misconstrued. So my Malcolm has deviated a little bit from the original Malcolm in terms of who he is in my head if that makes sense it makes uh, yeah it does it makes a lot of sense um but i, I still re- hear him in I my head in peter capaldi's yeah. voice plus if you keep doing the same thing over and over again people are eventually gonna get bored of it so you have to change yeah including up. me but yeah and i think that it's a logical progression you start lampooning a specific thing you then maybe identify stuff in the thing that you go i'm not so comfortable with that actually i don't like that i disagree with that i think yeah. it should be more like this and slowly and i think the key thing is as long as you do it slowly you can evolve it you can change it and you can keep it going and you might get to the point as you say in there where it's it's kind of yourself but heightened and i think that the one point maybe for people that don't do parody against takeaway is to have that moment of thinking and stopping going like what am i sending out what am i actually projecting to the world because so much of the Scottish independence movement, I think, is let down with like your generic flag with Indie Ref 2 in the name <laughs> account just screaming into the void. And maybe if there was more people that actually thought about, how does this look? What am I trying to present? You know, that might be beneficial for everybody involved. So it's a very, I mean, it's a kind of in-depth way to look at what is essentially a bunch of really stupid parody accounts, let's be honest. <laughs> but like, at the end of the day, there is a bit of psychology to that shit. And it is, it is actually quite, you know, it's it's not... As simple, I think, as people assume it would be. And um, mm. yeah, but the Facebook thing, I think that's going to die a death because it doesn't really kind of give you the avenue for this type of stuff. 
there's the generation coming up now that will be the first humans that will be documented from birth to death via <laughs> Facebook. And that really disturbs me. It'll be like in the future of that website lasts in three generations in the future. Like if say I'd been on it from birth to death, like my great, 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 great grandchildren will be able to look back on the internet and literally see what I was doing day to day. What dinner did he have on Thursday the 26th? <laughs> Mac and <laughs> cheese <laughs> again. Oh, wow, it's fascinating. <laughs> You get all these weird, creepy mothers that just take pictures of their children without the child's consent. So therefore, like, from baby to grown-up, their entire history is available online on the internet. So when that kid gets, like, age 15 in school, all their pals can see what they look like when they were seven and all that. It fucking freaks me out. Because we didn't used to do this. I can remember an era where this would have been, even back when MySpace was around, that we weren't doing that kind of shit back then. It, like, like the it changed in part because it became possible to do it. We had computers in the house in the 80s when nobody had computers. Um, and back then, you know, you the, the amount of memory, you know, the, there's, there's probably more mental capacity on my fucking personal tracker now than there was on that entire computer. Um, just to clarify, that's not a prison thing. Just that's where my head immediately went with that. <laughs> No, I'm just one of those. Welcome to the tag room. It's not a rag. <laughs> For those that can't see what we're saying, a fitness tracker. Just to be clear, uh, I'm not mugging people at the weekend or anything. Um, <laughs> we only get the classiest guests on this podcast. <laughs> you know, you know the the capacity of those computers was uh, was laughably minimal and all your storage had to be off the computer so you know you can remember if you wanted to play a game there was 15 minutes of listening to something like, eh, 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 and then it would fucking fail 12 minutes into loading and you have to go you know there was a good half hour run up again to play space invaders as you know these days we take all of that for granted and, and every year it gets faster and it gets cheaper storage gets cheaper and um you know I mean, even 20 years ago, internet access was rare. And if you had it, it was on dial up and it was incredibly slow. And I mean, I can remember when I first discovered Napster and I managed to fill a hard drive in a couple of days by downloading about 10 songs, you know, a piece of compact shit that I had with a one gigabyte hard drive at the time in like the year 2000. So, you know, this is... Yeah, no, you're you're definitely speaking the truth here. I mean, I remember being like 14 and uh, it's like a kind of teenage boy where you get broadband internet with all the access to pornography, but a tiny little hard drive to store it on. <laughs> <laughs> There's no fucking justice in that. And the image and will be like, like porn it, drives everything. It, so that's what happened. It, Some person it, went, it, we got to do something We've got to do something about drive, the porn. <laughs> this internet shit's amazing now, but we want to be able to keep it, you know? So, yeah. No, dead on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's always been folk who have wanted to share everything, though, like, you yeah, know, who would tell you what they had for lunch and stuff? There's always been folk who are like, and we used to avoid that you those need to people. Know everything, but yeah, you used to be able to avoid them. <laughs> yeah, you used to see them coming, and you'd finish your lunch quickly and leave the canteen. It's a kind of collective narcissism, isn't it? That yeah. if you do something and no one knows about it, then it didn't really matter. That, that's a, that's a great way to put it. Like I, I've always described it before as like it's a it's a popularity contest. Who's the most interesting day contest every day on Facebook? I love that term. It's a collective narcissism. So what that's... do you think about the whole anonymity thing? Because like folk do have a real go at that. I've seen a lot of like journalists, especially because they can't really be anonymous. Oh, boo-hoo. They like, are Fuck like, oh, em. these anonymous they've trolls huge, are terrible. Th- yeah, but they've like- got a big platform. I've got absolutely no fucking time whatsoever, really, for journalists complaining about people complaining about them. The default setting when you're online, whether it be an internet forum, a dating site, anything really, uh, in the early to mid-2000s was you did not use your real name. No, like, absolutely. It was really, really fucking weird. Anyway, it would be, it would be so weird on an internet forum back in, say, like 2005 to have someone with your actual photograph of what they looked like <laughs> and their actual username. That would be fucking weird as shit. To the point when Facebook first came out and MySpace and stuff like this actually it did feel quite weird when that first was around to start doing that I wasn't fully comfortable with it but then like eventually it kind of got to the point where it became more normalised and I think YouTube played a big role in that because content creators and putting your face to something meant something yeah. but even then a lot of the content creators on YouTube they would have their, their YouTube name so although you'd see them they'd still have another name so it was only really when actual celebrities 
Hmm. And journalists and media personalities began using social media. I think they made it more normal. So it was like to to promote their brand. Well, Rihanna's got to call herself Rihanna, and like Rihanna can't be Go Cat Thirty Five, right? Yeah, and like your fucking dude that writes for the Daily Mail or the Sun or the National, whatever else it is, it's like as much <laughs> as they, they'd 51. probably rather be on there <laughs> as Go Cat Twenty One or like loves to spooge Forty Six, whatever the fuck it's gonna be. You know, like you have to, yeah. Like in order to promote their brand, and it comes back to something I said in one of the previous podcasts about brand promotion. This it comes back to me trying to defend online abuse which is really awful for me doing this, but like if you're promoting a brand, so if you make yourself the brand, yeah. the consequence of making yourself the brand is going to be you're going to get shit thrown at you. Whereas a lot <clears> of the journalists <throat> seem to take the view that they can just say whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. And no, but like, but I'm on there and I'm using my actual face and my real name. I'm a real brave guy. And fuck you for saying to call me a dick. And you're going like, but you are a dick. But you are a dick. What you say is totally a dickish comment. <laughs> and I just use the analogy. It's like when I, I'm in work, if I stand up in the office and say something that no one agrees with and everyone tells me, Chris, you're a dick, shut the fuck up. I take that and go like, all right. Like, it, just because you're being yourself doesn't give you some kind of ability to walk through the internet, like, abuse-free. You know, the way most of us got around it was we kind of were self-aware enough to know that the better way to do it is to not be yourself online. One, for fucking security reasons. And two, because it gives you more freedom to say whatever the fuck you want. So the argument about this anonymous thing on the internet for me is just that it was not normal to do that and a lot of these media people that are now complaining about it, they're the ones that normalised it. So, like, we all agreed you'd be fucking insane to just give your official information, what you look like, your name, your even location. location detail, anything like that, to strangers on a global platform. You'd be fucking nuts to do that. Yeah. And then all these journalists come in and go like, no, but we got to sell our papers and sell our columns. And it's like... All right, but don't tell me that what you're doing is fucking sane because it's not. Yeah. And Facebook again, they are trying to they've tried to make this all seem like it's totally fucking normal. And I used Facebook when I was wearing the RAF because I was abroad, so I had to fucking keep in touch with people back home. It was a good tool for doing that. I still thought it was fucking strange. And as soon as I got home in 2014, whoo, deleted. Never went back to it. As I say, though, if you do want to like us on Facebook, you can do so at facebook.com slash Angus <laughs> It's not even true that um, you know the, the, the people who do the worst abuse are like the non accounts. You know, you can see tons and tons of folks saying ridiculous things with their own name and their own face. Yeah. They don't care. The people who are really, you know, obnoxious and horrible just don't care about the well, that's, that they're all Which like that. is why they're obnoxious and horrible, because they don't give a fuck. Yeah. If they gave a fuck, they'd be pretending to be somebody else. Or if they gave a fuck, they wouldn't be saying that shit in the first place. They're completely unself-aware about the fact that they're obnoxious cunts. I think that all humans are obnoxious cunts, for the most part. If you just go on a bus and see what humans are like for a bit, like everyone's just saying horrible shit all the time. We've all got hot takes. In, in any office you work in, everyone's fucking talking shit. Everyone's saying Every staff room's always had that. And it's this weird thing we've got on the internet now where, like, no, we've all got to say everything correctly the first time. And I, it's a very weird atmosphere. And I don't want to say, like, I'm defending abusive, like, you know, anything based to me on skin colour, gender, anything in that yeah. ballpark. My take on that has always been that's not attacking individual, that's attacking multiple people that can't help how they are born or how they look. But if some person on a bus or in a, or in a, in a staff room says a dumb thing, everyone around them has the right to go, shut the fuck up. The internet's no different. We have to have an online driver's license and we have to have everyone being themselves on the internet. Like, fuck off. Yeah, absolutely oh. fuck do you, off. Do you remember the story about the, the woman who she was just about to get on a plane to, I think it was South Africa or somewhere like that, and she she tweeted, oh, I hope I don't get AIDS or something like that. <laughs> yes. Like, yeah. And she didn't think like, anything of it. Like, you know, she didn't have many followers, didn't think it would be a big deal. But while she was in the air... Like, it became this huge thing. Like, you know, former contact her and her employers and all this. And, yeah. You know, 12 hours later, she jobs. gets off a plane, switches on her phone, and it's kaboom. I think John Ronson. John Ronson. Book about he'd it. been publicly uh, shamed. That and other uh, incidents yeah. where just ordinary people who have said something daft in the heat of the moment have then just been totally Ruined. Know, pounced upon by the yeah. brain mob of. Uh, People on social media who just want to like attack people. The worst yeah. bit is that I can't even plead innocent for not doing the mob thing because sometimes when someone does see a stupid fucking thing, you, you, know, you instinct, pile on. You're just like, yeah, we'll look at this it. dick. I mean, it was like, <laughs> what was that? Was it Ross Thompson went to Iraq 
uh, the, t- oh, the Tory yeah. guy, and he started like <laughs> posing and like Saddam Hussein's former like his, his own chair. <sighs> what are you doing, mate? You're a fucking politician, an elected official. Stop being yeah. a dick. But, if you're yeah. a politician or a cop, then I'm I think it's fine to pile on. It's like I love how we're trying to construct your like a kind of list that's allowed to be piled on here. Yep. Definitely it's, politicians. For it, us, it, is it people that? Yeah, I, either uh, assholes. Their, their employment. <laughs> actually somehow says that I'm morally superior to you. So police officers, politicians, because politicians are fucking weird. Journalists. Even political campaigners, though, because they still do the thing where they chap on your door going like, hi, I'm from this party. And I'm going to tell you that the way you think the world should be run is wrong. And my way is right. Vote for me. That's weird and psychotic. So I think they should be on the list. Um, I think it's but- about punching up rather than yeah. punching down. And that's, that's, it's just the same as the rules for comedy. If you've got somebody that's in a position of some sort of authority or power and they're behaving like a dick, it's abs- it's, it's, it's not merely all right to. I think it's your moral duty to point it out to them as many times as you feel is necessary. <laughs> I don't know though. <laughs> but, I- if you've, mm. but if you're punching down, so if you've got somebody that you just know happens to be a fucking idiot and they've said something idiotic. Does it benefit though? You might want to take them aside quietly at some point and say, you're being a dick, but you don't need to encourage everybody to pile on in that way for that person. I suppose, yeah. It, it's about people who have it's power the, being challenged. I guess it's the extreme of the, of the pile on though. I mean, there was a guy uh, that like sent some horrible abuse to Ruth Davidson. I mean, she does get quite a lot of like horrendous abuse, but it, it was specifically about her being a lesbian and it was fairly consistent. I, like I called that things. out. But I just, I was going like, and again, he was like a random nobody, but he was being a dick and I'm like, stop being a dick like yeah. you're, you're a horrible person and I think again like in the workplace I don't know how that rule works with like the punching up punching down thing I, I know it, it's maybe the, the severity of the pile on I can't plead totally innocent to it but the idea of like piling on for the retweets because yeah. that I think is a real thing where it's like yeah, you've got to question your own motivation of why you're doing it yeah are you actually like I think that's when you're going after like a corrupt police officer or a corrupt politician it's like then that's of greater societal benefit Whereas if you're just actually like scrolling the internet for hot takes, just to yeah. go, okay, that's a knob. I've got well, loads of retweets for this. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, is, there is actually like an account on Twitter. That's all it does. It's just, it, it's called Gourmet Hot Takes. And it is amazing. So you're just, it's, it's a wonderful <laughs> window into the horrors of the internet. But like when you actually look at it, that's all that person that that thing is doing. He's probably making loads of money off of it now. But like, all that person does is just scrolling the internet for random shit to go, look what this wanker fucking said. So I, I, again, I'm still like, as long as your abuse is not general to like multiple people for things they cannot help like their skin color their gender their height their hair color things like this that's any other kind of abuse i'm like well i'll kind of i'll take on a case by case basis after that in terms of like the um like parried accounts what i think they go wrong with is they pick someone who they don't like just for the purpose of slagging them off and then they just say stuff that they think will piss off that person. Yeah. And I think that's just not funny at all. <laughs> yeah, like affectionate parody, I think, is that's where all the good parody comes from. It's like Austin Powers. Yeah. It's like, clearly that's coming from like a loving place of like, these terrible old Bond movies are awful, but I fucking love them anyway. It's that tension. You've got to have like, be able to slag the person off, but also have some a kind of appreciation of where they're coming from at the same time. Yeah. I think those are the best ones. Yeah, because you, I mean, you're a big fan of Malcolm Tucker in the thick of it. I yeah, I I am. I'm, I have watched them multiple times. I am a, a big fan. I'm a huge fan of Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister as well, um, which I you know I'm going to say is is better written. I, I watched Yes Prime Minister when it was first on, and I would have been relatively young, but I was. Sp- Bellbound by it. To be honest, I'd recommend starting with Yes Prime Minister, I think, because the, the, the prior series is, is a little bit more, I think it had to be quite politically savvy, maybe to get some of that <laughs> stuff. Whereas the, the, the Yes Prime Minister is quite broad strokes. Yeah. It will terrify you how relevant it, it still, still is, is. And how well it holds up. I see, it, it may take you a few episodes to kind of get in the rhythm of it because it's a bit of a kind of older style. But uh, I went back to it uh, very recently and was very pleasantly surprised about how well it actually held up to this day. Because a lot of things don't, uh, you know, to, to pick a thing at random. I, I remember just, just a few months back seeing an episode of Open All Hours, which as a kid I loved and I watched it and I was like, Oh my fucking Christ, I can't believe how awful and unpolitically correct, <laughs> you know, how politically incorrect this is and how, you know, he's just, I never noticed. I never noticed. I had no issues with it at the time you watch now. You think, think though, oh my fucking Christ. To be fair though, I do think that um, the BBC have a slightly skewed version of their own like uh, 
production success uh, in the early years because the thing is like it's like Faulty Towers it's the greatest comedy of all time it's it's in the top five it's amazing and if you look oh, back it's alright <laughs> yeah and I'm going like you would say that if you had like three channels to pick from yeah. like if there was literally nothing else on you would probably <laughs> fucking watch it and the BBC have this like really deluded approach to like their early archive of stuff because like who the fuck were you competing with like because they were like a state broadcaster right off the bat until ITV eventually got on the go and it took a while for them to really hit a stride with really anything like yeah I'm sure this was the highest fucking rated thing and everyone was watching and oh yeah we remember that nostalgia but like what else were you gonna fucking do whereas like now you've got like all like this limitless archive of comedy to look at and there's no fucking way Faulty Towers is anywhere near the top five so even the fucking top ten comedies that have been made ever but yet the BBC still to this day will like hold it up there like John Cleese is the god of comedy and you're like he's not really that funny like cause I think Red Dwarf for me is like probably maybe the second best comedy ever created in my first opinion. three seasons but- as soon as they started having good production values it it became joke, yeah it, it took it, away from the joke the yeah, joke I thought was, when it was more of a parody initially when it looked, unintentionally yeah, yeah. When, when it looks like a sh- it looked used to the spaceship used to look like a shithole yeah and you believed it in much the same way that in Alien you know the mm. the ship looks like a shithole it looks like somewhere where dockers and fucking truck drivers it's a weird, live and work yeah. as soon as it starts it's, it, it, as soon as they put it onto a, you know, a very, very high definition camera format and started to have loads of special effects and money, it's stop. It's kind of like the uncanny valley. Once you, you know, you get better and better, and then it gets to that place where it's a bit weird. Yeah, and it just doesn't look right because it's too close to being. Yeah, like, it's kind of like a lot like. of like the, some of the horror movie remakes. It's like, well, a lot of the charm was the fact they did look kind of bad. It's like the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, which I just want to pretend never happened, but I think it was a thing in 2010. It was like a complete CGI fest. It misses the point. People aren't, most people aren't watching horror films um, because they're believable. They're, they're, a lot of people are watching old horror films to have a right good laugh at them. Yeah. It's, because, it adds to the comedy is what you're saying there about yeah. like the Red Dwarf thing. But I think the one thing I would want to say about the Red, Red Dwarf as a show, though, is that it, it, it much like as I'm saying, this, you know, the BBC looking back at certain shows and holding them up is like the greatest thing we've ever done. It's like, they have never had any fucking respect for that show, even though, like, it was one of the highest rated shows in the late, late 90s. I think it was mm. like that and fucking Robot Wars, I think, were like the two most popular shows they did. And it's aged really well. The other thing about it is that um, two out of the four main cast are people of colour. Mm. which was really ahead of its time. You never even noticed either. You didn't think about got, it. And they never wrote an episode where that was even brought up. There was class war issues in it, but it was never to do with that. And they just fucking papped off to Dave, like, oh, have that, because we've still got faulty towers and it's still amazing. And you're like, even though it's like really racist and not funny, and you're going like, what the fuck? But it's stuff like that really bugs me about the Beeb sometimes, just to be like... Yeah, right, let's did- get rid of Red Dwarf and we'll put on House and Bouquet. Like... <laughs> yeah. Every day. So we could have brought these guys back and paid them decent money to put on like what is probably still one of the best comedies in production to this day. But no, we'll do this instead. So I don't know, it's like I think, uh, privatize the fucking beeb. It needs to be. It won't learn its lesson until we can actually not give it money. Because if you're forced to, how does it know when it's putting out shit? Like, because TV ratings are a fucking lie now. Because everything's like you either tape it on the box or you get it on download. So I don't know if they've given any idea now about what people are genuinely watching. How the fuck did we get onto the BBC of all things? (laughs) 